Hey, good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I am Ken Walls and I am your host and we have another exciting episode lined up for you guys today. Um, I was recently introduced to this gentleman that I have on today and he is, um, man, he's got a story so I'm just going to let him tell it. I want to welcome my new buddy Matt Kubler to the show. Matt, what's going on man? How welcome right? man. Appreciate I'm excited. It. Appreciate you coming on. It's going to be a blast. I'm excited to, uh, to share with you. I, you know, I have a lot of friends over in the Philadelphia area now, and um, you guys pulled off one heck of a win yesterday. Man, well, we didn't have a preseason, apparently. The coach didn't think that they needed to put the starters in for anything. So the first half was our, uh, <laughs> I guess, week three preseason game. So uh, luckily, the second half, they, they woke up and played a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, they... Uh, they did a little better than my team did. We won't even go there. But, um, yeah, it was embarrassing. But um, so, so you know, <clears throat> I created this show about a year and a half ago. Um, and, and it was because I've been very, very blessed in my life. And I wanted to find a way to give back more. And, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of power and sharing our stories to to other people and transparency and all that stuff and and i just want to want to kind of start out by saying you know why don't you tell everybody where you're from where you were born and raised well i currently live in a small town outside of philadelphia called royers ford um which is about 20 miles northwest of the city okay. and i grew up in a town called Potsdam, which is only about 10 miles away from here um little urban town uh, with my mom, I had a single, my mom was a single mom. My, my parents got divorced when I was really young and um, grew up with my older brother, Andy. And for the first 18 years, man, it was a struggle just trying to, to keep food on the table and uh, provide. But my mom, you know, I, everything I, I learned about work ethic, I learned from my mom. And my mom worked three jobs. She never, never took a day off. She would come home for an hour, lay down, catch a 30 minute nap, go in for a next job. So it was just a constant um, struggle for my mom to make sure that my brother and I were OK. And, and it was even harder because my brother was special needs. He, had, he was back then considered mentally retarded. But knowing what we know today about um, certain diagnoses, he, he was autistic, wow. high functioning wow. autism. Um, my brother could tell you every verse from the Bible, but he couldn't tell you how many pennies were in a dollar. It was. Uh, Wow, very unique wow. way that my brother saw the world. My mom says he saw it with technicolor, that he was just, it was just different. Yeah. And uh, he also had a severe stutter, which I think was probably the, the most debilitating thing that my brother had to deal with just because it was on the outside. He looked like you and I, there was no, no difference. Um, nobody would have known he was autistic just by looking at him. But the minute he opened his mouth, people realized there was a problem because he literally couldn't say a sentence without stuttering. Wow. Which was tough. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, growing up, we lived in public housing for a majority of my life. Um, so in those environments, it's not necessarily um, ideal to have something that makes you stand out, make you different. Yeah, sure. And so there, every day was someone, you know, calling my brother a retard or a moron or a dummy or making fun of his stutter. And and ultimately, that ended up with me getting into a fist fight with whoever was saying that. And uh, I lost most of them. <laughs> I, I, I didn't you did? I, I did. Oh, I did. I was, you know, I'm six foot three, 250 now. And up until the end of ninth grade, I was five foot four. Oh, wow. So I wasn't a big guy. I was a short, stocky um, fire plug. Wow. Who had a lot of a lot of protective genes in them. So I always wanted to make sure my brother was safe and anybody that hurt my brother had to deal with me, whether I got my ass kicked or not. So wow. uh, I learned how to fight though through, through the losses. I learned um, <laughs> how to take a punch, how to try to avoid a punch and yeah. ultimately have to lay one. So um, wow. when my brother was 18, he, he unfortunately was killed in a car accident. Hmm. And, uh, you know, people, and this, would, this was your older brother. Did you say yeah, older? older? Yeah, he was almost three years older. But I mean, by proxy, I was the older brother by, right, by just right. the cognitive level. Yeah, sure. Uh, but he was three years older than me almost. And, uh, you know, the day that he died was the the single worst moment of my life. Mm. Uh, to this day, and that's 30 years ago. 
And, uh, you know, it, the hardest thing, and, and, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people listening to your show that have suffered loss. Sure. Um, I'm sure you've suffered, suffered loss. And, you know, we all deal with it differently. Mm-hmm. And um, up until that point, I'd lost people. I'd lost my, to my grandparents. I'd, like, one grandfather died when I was a baby. My parents got divorced. So, I mean, I've had a lot of loss in, in the first 18 years of my life. But knowing what I know now, you know, if I can go back and, and, and have revisionist history, I would say that I had PTSD after my brother died. Sure. And the thing that, that I've learned about PTSD is that it has nothing to do with the military and it has nothing to do with law enforcement. It has to do with trauma and trauma that your brain was unprepared for. Right. And in my entire life, I would have never thought for one second that my brother was not going to be living in my house for the remainder of his life and that he would always just be there. That was the way I envisioned everything to be. And I wake up one morning, July 12, 1989, and by the end of that day, my brother was dead. Jeez. And that's not something you prepare for. And for me, that put me into this cycle of depression and sadness and anger and guilt and all these these emotions that come with loss, but I never, I never managed them. I never dealt with them in, on a productive way. And a month after he died, I went in the army. So I didn't have this this period of, of mourning. So wait, he, he so you were 18. He wasn't 18. No, he was 21. Oh, I was going to say, wait a minute. How'd you go in the army at 15? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, okay, okay. Wow. So so was he driving? Yes, and that's I knew that was going to be... Listen, you don't know how many people have asked me, your brother was driving? So... <laughs> Like I said, he was high functioning. My brother was meticulous with detail. Wow. Um, his he dressed every day, slacks, button down shirt, tie, sweater vest, impeccable. He, he his room was spotless. Um, it took him I don't know how many times, seven times, to pass the written test. Oh wow. Uh, my brother, um, a cognitive fear of test taking. And which, you know, he suffered through it from school and everything. So it's not like taking a driver's test was going to be different. But when it came to driving a car, my brother was phenomenal. Yeah. My brother, if the speed limit was 25, he did 25. You know, he was seatbelt on, mirrors in the right places, 10 and 2 in the hands. Yeah. Um, washed the car every day. Just everything had to be perfect. And unfortunately, the reason my brother crashed his car wasn't because he made a mistake. It's because he went unconscious. And... To this day, we don't really know why. Um, uh, I have I have theories. Um, I believe he probably had a brain a brain aneurysm or some sort of a a bleed on his brain, which caused him to go unconscious and veer into an oncoming car and hit head on. And uh, um, I can still picture the car um, at wow. the at, at the auto body shop where it was towed to. Um, and the day that he died, I was, you know, my stepdad, my mom had got remarried when I was 12. My stepdad had uh, just changed uh, the clutch on my brother's car. And he said, hey, keep an eye on the car for your brother. Make sure that it's driving right. And if for any reason you think there's a reason for him not to drive it, get him to and from work. Yeah. Granted, there was nothing wrong with my brother's car, but I wished that day I'd have driven him to work. And, uh, and I think that that survivor's guilt played a lot into my, my depression sure. and the PTSD. And, you know, I, I was angry at God because my brother was a very pure kid. Like he wasn't, he, he was never mean, everything. He was Christ loving, went to church. He lived his life the way that everybody should with an open and kind heart. Right. And I felt very angry at God for taking my brother and, um, I was just angry at myself. I was just angry at everybody. And, and I spent the next 13 years in that, that sort of hamster wheel of, of anger and, and guilt and sadness. By the way, a buddy of mine who lives over there with you in the Philly area, Joe Skelly, said, been on here 30 seconds and already like this guy, fellow Philly sports fan. <laughs> Thank you, my man. Go Birds. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so you said you spent the next 13 years – um, so you went into the army though, like mm-hmm. a month later, was that planned already? you had already planned. Yeah. And actually I was actually told I could back out because I was the sole surviving son. Uh, 
and uh, my brother was really proud of me for joining the army, and yeah. he was excited to say that his brother, like when my brother would meet people, and it's funny, the one girl he ever loved, um, and she was younger, and my brother bowled, that was his thing, he went bowling, and uh, he had met this girl, Jane Marie, who was, my brother was probably 20, and she was 15 or 16, yeah. so let's just say it wasn't, mentally my brother and her might have been on the same path, but my brother physically was older, so that was a, yeah. a no but he loved her, and and I think she had a crush on him, which I know now she did. And but when he first met her, he, his opening line was, "Hi, do you want to see a picture of my brother?" Oh wow! So, dude, I just that just gave me chills. Wow, that's just who he was. Yeah. So he was very proud that I was going into military because he wanted to tell people. Yeah, yeah. About so. Wow. You know, the military was good and bad for me. It was good because it allowed me to get away. Sure. You know, I ended up spending three years in Germany and then some, a little bit of time over in the Gulf War. And, but it also was very bad for me because I, I found drinking yeah. uh, in excess. Um, and, and that would cause me to do things that were not healthy for me. Right. And uh, luckily, <clears throat> they weren't life-changing decisions that I made. Um, they could have been, but they weren't. Sure. But uh, and when I got out of the army in in 1993, um, a few months after that, I, I became a cop. <laughs> so I, I didn't really have any downtime in any of that. It just was one service industry to another. So you went from you went from the military directly into being a, a law enforcement officer in Philadelphia yeah. or in your yeah, in suburban Philadelphia. Yep, <clears throat> outside of the city. Wow. And, and that was in 93, you said? Yep. Wow. So, um, when you were, when you were over in Germany and you said you did a little stint in the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, I'm assuming. Yep. Um, hold it. There were two, right? Oh, there was <laughs> only one. It was Desert Shield, Desert Storm. But... Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. And then that's there was right. a delay and then we yeah. decided... Yeah, my bro go. my little brother was over there too in the navy, um, but but the um, so you 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 discovered alcohol, um, you discovered that that drinking alcohol excessively was a good thing for a minute, <laughs> right? And then it caused other things. But so so you but you didn't really get in any serious hot water over any anything. Well, well I, I spent two nights in jail in two different countries. Um, that's serious <laughs> hot water. Well, funny story. So um, when I Hold was it. in, uh, we have a we have a cop telling us he spent time in jail. <laughs> I've been a cop for twenty six years. They can't take that back. So, uh, um, and this has been told several times. Sure. But uh, when I was in in Intel school in Texas. Um, we would get furloughed and we went to Mexico one night or one weekend, little town, border town called Acuna, Mexico. And, uh, there was a bar there. It's still there. I Googled it. Wow. Called Crosby's. And, uh, long story short, I thought it was a good idea to jump from the bar onto a chandelier to try to land on a table. Oh. And, uh, the chandelier didn't hold. And it came crashing down on top of me and spent a night that night. The federalities got us and put us in jail for that night and I had to be bailed out by my drill sergeant. Oh, okay, fine. So uh, that, was, that was lesson number one, which you would have thought I would have learned something from. Right. And lesson number two happened three days before I got out of the Army. Um, one of my best friends, um, but when, you're in the, when you're military and you're leaving the military, they throw what's called a hail and farewell. Yeah. And... Um, so my supervisors, my lieutenants and captains, everybody um, took me out to a beer fest, which was in town. And if you know anything about Germany, every town has a beer fest um, <laughs> during fest season. And um, I got out in June. And the, the beginning of summer starts the fest season leading up to October, fest in October. Yeah. So um, this one I actually didn't do. Um, a buddy of mine who was one of my best friends. Um, was about 50 feet from me, but there's about a hundred people between us inside this big beer tent. Yeah. And uh, I hear his, his deep Kentucky Southern drawl saying, don't push me again. 
And I look over and I see him punch a guy in the face with a beer mug, which is the, one of those big one liter beer mugs. Whoa. And flayed him wide open, knocked him unconscious. So I got him out of there. And the next morning I have the MPs pounding on my door and um, they handcuffed me. And uh, so I was arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do anything. So now, mind you, I knew Jamie had, had hit this guy and that this was what it was about. But I didn't say anything. And I covered for him for about a week. And my ETS papers got um, withdrawn while I was waiting court martial. And, oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> and luckily, you know, Jamie came forward. And unfortunately, they thought he was covering for me at first. And then I found out that there was a second person hit that Jamie didn't admit to because he didn't hit that person. So now I was charged with the unknown person being hit, and Jamie was charged with the person he was hit with. Long story short, it all got worked out, and I, I got released with no charges, and I was wow. cleared. Thing. But I spent an extra month in the Army, and uh, so those are my two overseas um, alcohol-involved, uh, <laughs> funny now, not so funny then. <laughs> yeah, story. not so funny then. Wow. So so you come back, and, and, and the whole time, you know, your uh, your mom is is still here in the states um probably very proud of you i'm sure for for you know your service and by the way thank you for your service in the military and what you currently do and have done for years thank you. um but my and my hat is literally we talked a little bit about it before the show started like there's no way I could be a, no way I could be in law enforcement. No, it just like, <laughs> I no, I couldn't anyway. So, um, so, so you went directly from the army. You said about a month later you became, I started testing and within four months I was hired as a police officer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so you, um, you, so you started doing the, the law enforcement thing. Was the alcohol still an issue then? Was there, was there? Yeah. Was um, it? That, that really took a, I, I took a really long break from alcohol. Um, right around the time I started having kids. Um, because I kind of knew that I couldn't, I couldn't live that life. So when you're single and you're 23 or yeah. whatever it was, you know, even when I got out of the military, you know, you go to the bars and I'm a cop now and, you know, they get down to three to 11 shifts, stay to the bar till two, sometimes sleep there, get up, eat breakfast at the bar. <laughs> like there was, there was a lot of, and that was common for a lot of us. Um, there was a, a younger core of police officers who, you know, we, we worked hard, we, part, we played hard. And, yeah, yeah. and that's not necessarily, uh, it sounds cool on a bumper sticker, but it's not really cool for real life. And, uh, right. you know, I was lucky enough that, God put my wife into my life, um, you know, within my first year being a cop in November 94 and um, fell in love with her and, and married her. And, you know, we got married in 1997. So between, you know, those years, I started to have a little bit more maturity, a little bit more responsibility, a little bit less free time on my hands because I now had a, a serious relationship. And right. um, we got married and, and we got pregnant a month after we got married and had a baby a premature baby, um, eight months after that. Wow. And the, the, the significant part of all this was that I was still going through this PTSD and I was, mm. I was, I was numbing my pain and my sorrow and my guilt, um, with alcohol. And then unfortunately I thought that if I found the love of my life and then married her and then had a child, that that would then make everything better. And right. it didn't. Right. Um, right. It, it didn't. And the sad part of that is that I couldn't get, I knew my brain was a hundred percent connected to what was going on. I just couldn't fix my heart and right. I couldn't change the, the, the sadness that I was feeling. And I didn't know how to get out of this cycle. I knew it was in, it was happening. I recognized it every single day. And it wasn't like somebody told me I was an asshole and ooh, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> I knew it. I knew that there was this part of me that was just broken. So, right. um, and the sad part is I couldn't give my wife and my daughter what they needed, um, yeah. emotionally. I knew in my head, I had a list of checklist of things I had to accomplish as a father and as a husband. Like I knew I had to do this, 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 and this in order to be successful. Right. Um, and I did them very well. I just couldn't connect. And uh, that's the sad part about all that is that even though I removed alcohol from the equation, 
um, I still wasn't happy. <laughs> right, right. And that's a hard thing to admit when you you have the love of your life and you have this beautiful child mm-hmm. who needs that you can't provide that. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I told you I'm I'm 17 years sober, and and you know it's um, I can relate. <laughs> I mean, I can totally relate. It's I call it the empty. I call it the God hole. Like we're we're trying to fill fill this empty space. The PTSD, which I had, you know, like all of that, and and we're trying to fill it with something else, and <clears throat> it just doesn't work. No, and and I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't have my faith, and even though I'm the son, my stepfather's a pastor. I mean, I wow. I, the, the church is not something I'm not aware of. <laughs> I mean, right. Part of my life. And, and I had separated myself from it, um, from my, my religion, from my faith, um, after my brother died, because I said, there's no God on this that I know of that would take the most pure human that I've ever known in my life. Why would he do that? And why would he leave me alone? Right. Like, why would you do this to me? Mm-hmm. And, you know, when, when you go through your struggles, when you go through this, this, um, depression, the sadness. Um, there's probably many opportunities throughout those 13 years where God showed me a way out that I didn't pay attention to. Yeah. I'm pretty certain of that. Um, thankfully, um, I was shown some grace, um, in 2002 when my son was born, um, who I named after my brother. And that's not significant. It's not that I was, whether I had a boy or a girl, I was we're going to love that child as, to the best that I could. But for whatever reason, when my son was born, we had people over and, um, it was probably three months old, maybe two months old. And my grandmother had come over and she gave me a package. Now, I don't know if you ever, I know I'm sure you have kids, but you know, yep. when, when people come to bring gifts for your newborn child, the guys are usually in the other room watching football and having a beer and the women are in there opening a one, you know, one's right. easy and diaper genies and, and stuff like that. And yeah. for whatever reason, my grandmother had said, you need to be in here. So, um, she had given me a package and it was a box, a pretty big box. And I opened it up and in the box is a quilt. Now I'm not a quilt guy. <laughs> I don't have an <laughs> yeah. appreciation for quilts. Uh, <clears throat> sure. So I immediately folded it up and handed it back to my grandmother thinking that that was supposed to go to my wife. And my grandmother is um, an amazing woman, and she is um, one of three women that I'm deathly afraid of. <laughs> and when when she tells me to look at something or to do anything, I listen. Right. So I handed it back, and she said, look at it. So I take it back out, and I start to look at it. And, you know, there's all these different colors and patterns and um, textures, and, and there's two teddy bears, one at the top, one underneath it at the bottom, and one of them has Andy stitched in gold. Um, wow. And what, what hit me was that I made a, a rule very early that my son was going to be Andrew mm. and my brother's Andy yeah. and Andy stays Andy and there's no other Andy. Right. So when I saw that, I'm like, holy crap. And then it started to dawn on me all the different colors and textures that I, I was looking at were actually pieces of clothing that were my brother's. Oh my God. And my grandmother um, had kept. <clears throat> wow. The week, the week my brother died. Uh, my mom and stepdad were on vacation and I was staying with friends, just going to work and my brother was staying with my grandmother. Wow. And when he died, she kept all his clothes. Wow. And for whatever reason, 13 years later, not when my daughter was born, not when I got married, like this, for this moment was this, you know, this was time for me to let go. So Jeez, uh, I just got full body chills again. Trust me. I do too. Every time I tell that story, Jeez. Uh, so that night, um, I'm, I took the quilt with me down to my basement office, and I started to cry and write memories um, about my brother, like the most vivid, clear um, memories. When people read my book, they tell me how amazed they are at the clarity of the memories. And those memories were written that night. And wow. I wrote 26,000 words in eight hours. And I came back up the next morning. It's around 7, 7.30 in the morning. And the house we were in at the time, the basement door opened up into the kitchen, which um, the window was uh, in the east. You would face the east. So the sun would always come up into that window. 
And I don't know if it's because I, I wasn't paying attention or didn't care, but I'd never seen the sun rise through there, like the sunlight coming through the window. Like I never paid attention to it. Wow. And that morning when I came up, I saw color, like technicolor. <laughs> I saw everything. Wow. Every layer of color coming through the light in that window. And I remember thinking how beautiful it was. Wow. And uh, that is when it lifted. Wow. That's when it lifted. Dude, the fact that you've been able to, to, to tell this story without, I'd, I'd be a, I'd be a blubbering mess right now. So my, trust uh, me, it's sitting right about here. I, I know. I, I see it. I see it. Um, wow, man, that's, that's, um, that's intense. And, and listen, everybody watching right now feels that man, they, they feel it because we've all, we've all been there where there's, there's something we're hanging on to <clears throat> that's um, detrimental to our our success in life and happiness and joy and peace and and um, that that's um, see that's that's what I, I think that I, and I, I don't want to you know break religious on you or anyone because I'm uh, you know, I run the social media for our church and, and, um, sometimes I'm shocked. They even let me in there. <laughs> I'm like, wow, they're actually going to let me in here. Um, but you know, that's the thing is, is, is we're all carrying something that keeps us stuck. And, and some people carry it to their grave and never experience life because of it. And, and, you were given a blessing and an opportunity just like when I was given the gift of, of being free from alcohol at 34 years old, you know, I, I, it, it became, it took years later, but it became my, um, duty to, you know, share with the world that there's, man, there's a better way to live. You don't have to live like that, you know? And there's blessings waiting for you on the other side of all this crap you've got. And so, um, dude, you're doing that. Yeah. And it feels better. <laughs> right. It really does. And I, and I tell people that, that I went from having like the other side of the feeling spectrum of anger, guilt, sadness, sorrow, all those hate, um, lots of hate, um, yeah. to like, and I trust me, I can still hold a grudge and I still want to ram my fist down people's suck holes. Don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> but that's not cool I for to, a six foot three cop to feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I can temper that. Um, but I've learned that the, the, the ability to feel all the other amazing emotions. Right. On like a hyper level yeah. is so much more um, uplifting. Like I so I, I give, you know, every every month a few talks every month and I get to share that story on stage and I cry. My goal is that if I can't, if the day that that doesn't happen where I can't physically go back in my mind and my heart to the moment when I'm telling that story, as if you're watching it happen live when it actually occurred, if yeah. the minute I can't do that anymore, I'm done. I'm not having any more. I'm not talking anymore. I'm not speaking anymore. Yeah. Um, because that's people want to know how after 30 years, it's so real because I want it to be like, I want my brother Every yeah. day in my home. Well, <clears throat> knowing you for now officially on 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 video audio at least for for about the last forty minutes, um, I have a, a a very sneaky suspicion that that's not the the day that happens will be the day that um, you know you're being put in the ground. So yep. um, I I don't think that's I, I don't see that as as even a possibility, man. So. Um, so you, I know that you, you, so you wrote your book, you, um, in one, in eight hours. Well, I wrote the, the, the beginning of it. So 26,000 okay. words That's in eight crazy. hours. Wow. And so I called my mom. My mom is a retired English teacher and I tell this story too, cause people don't believe it. I read one book from ninth grade until I was whatever, 30 
six years old. Um, and I was Animal Farm in ninth grade, and from cover to cover. But I had the uncanny ability to take small pieces of information and, and put together a story in my brain and yeah. write. So I call my mom and I say, Mom, I had 26,000 words of Andy, memories of Andy. What do I do? She goes, you write a book. And I said, well, Mom, you know I haven't read a book since Animal Farm in ninth grade. She goes, well, maybe you should. And when this happened, I had just um, – I was, I was just beginning my time as an air marshal. I was a United States Federal Air Marshal after 9-11. So wow. um, I had a lot of time in airports and hotels and airplanes to to start to read and, and open up my mind a little bit to, to what um, a book is about. <laughs> wow. So I actually read a lot of books um, and realized that I probably could write one, especially since I don't have to do character development or scene setting. I'm, I'm just telling my life story with my brother. So, um, 2006 from 2002. So my son was born in September of 2002. Um, and I finished the book in February of 2006. And it's not a book you can just sit down and write in its totality because it's, it's a lot of hard stuff. Yeah. Drain you. I, and I would, when I wrote it, I wrote it and relived it. It wasn't just a memory recount. I actually relived it again. Yeah. And so I had to take breaks. Um, I'm sure in, in order to just, not get um, completely wiped out, and I still had other functions to do on a daily basis. So in 2006, uh, February is when it was published. I self-published it. Um, and that was, you know, people ask me, you know, today, and I'm writing my, my next book, which is called The Accidental Speaker, because I didn't want to be a speaker. Right. Uh, I became a speaker because of my brother's story. Sure. And people ask me all the time, why don't you re redo the book and re-release it and do what everyone else is doing, which is you know, subcategorize yourself down to the minutia so you can get your Amazon number one bestseller, which is the trick. I get it. But I can't do that because right. that book's in my life. Right, right. It's never going to be a piece of my marketing strategy. Right, right. It's, it's simply the thing that saved my life and allowed me to go down this path I'm on now. So um, wow. I won't do that. That's dude. That's um. Well, that's admirable. And and yeah, there are a lot of people that 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 do what you're talking about with the sub 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 categories of. I I, I did not know that. Brothers who died with autism and stuttering in 1989. Woohoo! I'm the, <laughs> best I'm the only book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm number one. It's the only book in the category. But no, I yeah I I know people that have that have done that and you know whatever floats their boat, man. Um, but like, so, so with, and, and you skipped a couple of things there, not intentionally, but like, so you came back, you were a, a, a police officer for a local, um, department outside of Philadelphia. Um, and then you became an air marshal. Like how did you just like quit your police job and went to federal and how did that yeah. happen? So Not to go I, off topic, but that that's no, it's a cool story. So, yeah. the morning of 9/11, we had uh, I was on the SWAT team, and we had just got done finishing a high risk drug search warrant. Uh -huh. And I, I got oh, to, you and, were on the SWAT team. Yeah, I was on the SWAT team from 1996 until 2002. And uh, um, that morning we get done. I worked midnight shift. We went and did the the search warrant, and I was going to bed. And I went to bed. And this is you know I had a I probably had a a cell phone of some sort, maybe one of those big Nokia's or whatever, but yeah. I didn't keep it in my room. And so my, my house phone is blowing up at like eight 46 in the morning. And, um, it's my best friend who's now the chief of police in uh, a neighboring town here. And he's telling me to turn on the TV. Something's happened with the world trade centers. And I'm like, listen, if they didn't fly a plane into, you know, three or four Westmore Latin road where I used to live, don't call me. I'm tired. And then my phone keeps ringing. Finally, I get up and turn the TV on and I see what happened. And I immediately got angry. Yeah. And um, the patriotic blood that flows through me um, wanted to respond. And the next morning I saw President Bush get on um, the news and say he was reenacting the Sky Marshal program, which at the time was down to 33 um, United States Sky Marshals who were flying only international flights on American-owned commercial airlines. Uh. Because it had just it had been dwindled down to almost a, a non-entity within the government, and uh, 
I went on the uh, website for the FAA and put in my application and told my wife that I was applying. She said, hell no. And uh, I said, well, I said, let's just see what happens. Yeah. Sure as shit, I get, I get selected in one of the first few phases of the, the program and went out to the middle of nowhere in New Mexico and trained with Delta Force and Navy SEALs and private contractors and had the best training of my life and came back and started flying commercial airline flights undercover. And it was, uh, the first year was fun. Yeah. And then they created the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Because uh, the FAA, they called the FAA the forgotten about agency, FAA. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were like this subcategory law enforcement entity, like counterterrorism law enforcement entity that of the FAA. So we were like the most forgot about. And, <laughs> and that was fun because we had a lot of latitude to do things. And sure. Of, um, ability to, to, to do things. And then they, just like the federal government does, they bureaucratized everything. And I don't even know if that's a word. Um, but <laughs> it became such a top heavy you know, low man on the totem pole right. uh, type job. And I was never home. And um, even though I was dealing with now better with my brothers, I, I wasn't necessarily functioning as a husband and father yeah. when I was constantly never home. So after about four and a half years, I, I got out of that and, and went back to local law enforcement. And, and were uh, you, like, were you on a, were you on a flight every day? Yeah, 4,238 flights in four years and three months. Jeez. Not wow. that I kept every one of my boarding passes or anything. Are they Are they all, were they all um, domestic or were there any international? Yeah, every month we went on rotation for international. Good uh, Lord. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, it was 80% domestic. And then we'd go on our international rotation. And then, uh, you know, it was, uh, the training was amazing. I'm sure the, the guys I worked with were amazing. Yeah. Um, I even had a few good supervisors, <laughs> but for the most part it's federal government. And with the federal government comes, you either have to be willing to just get beaten down into the, the become almost like a robot. Yeah. If you can't go there, if you can't become a droid and just go with the flow and do your job. Yeah. It's not the place for you. And I realize that I'm not that guy. Um, I'm counter joining to begin with. I don't, I don't join anything particularly yeah. unless there's some grand purpose. Yeah. And once that grand purpose is no longer being served, then I go. And, uh, so that's, that's what I did. And, and I'm happy I did because I became a much better husband and father, um, and wow. son and, and, um, when I came home. Wow, man. So you came back and, <clears throat> and went back to, uh, now, did you go back to a local? You're the yep. same, the same no, a different one. police department. Okay, a okay. different one. And uh, I was lucky enough. The chief there is one of my best friends. So there was, unfortunately, one of the guys there had passed away from cancer, and there was an opening. Mm. And you know, it's just another sign from yeah. God to, to help help steer me in the direction I need to go into. And I've been there for 13 years. Um, wow. And I'm really blessed because they allow me to have my non-police life as well, which is very rare. Yeah, sure. In law enforcement, there's very few cops that are allowed to go and be someone else, another part of their life and allow that to grow. Usually you're a cop and you're a cop and that's it and you're a cop. Right. <laughs> and, and I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm 26 years on the job now. I'm not, I'm not the most aggressive cop anymore. I'm not, I'm more of a community minded guy. I'm not, uh, yeah. not looking to kick down doors and take names and kill terrorists. I've, I've done all that already. It's in my past. And now I'm trying to transition out safely. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so, um, so you have 26 years as a cop. Yep. Wow. And how long in the military? Four. Yeah. Jeez, man. Now, does that carry over into the, no, I didn't think so. I mean, so. you can buy it back. You, they, <clears throat> oh. There's a way you can buy your time. Okay. Uh, and I may do that, but, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm very, I'm very happy with where I'm at. I'm very happy with the situation I'm in. I have my businesses. I have speaking. I have a podcast. I got, you know, yeah. my, my daughter's a collegiate all American swimmer. So I'm constantly traveling with her and with my wife and son and my son's wow. a junior high school and he wants to go military academy. So my life is always moving. So there's no, uh, there's no boredom and idle time's never been my friend. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, I hate idle time. 
So, so you have, um, and, and we're going to talk about your businesses too, man. So, um, but I, I want to ask you about the, um, the speaker thing, because like that, like, I, I don't know that everybody's really caught on to that, that, you know, we've mentioned it a few times, but you're a speaker and, and you go out and, and you, you speak. So like, who do you speak to and how did that all come about? How'd that start? Well, it started with me um, writing the book okay. and, and some people that um, knew my brother, knew my story and read the book, okay. wanted me to talk about the book, um, which then turned into me just telling a story. Um, I consider myself a storyteller. And, um, you know, my, the greatest gift my brother ever gave me is, is the memories and my ability to go back in time to moments, to good times, to sad times. Um, yeah. and relive them and in a way that people can visually picture. And so that started that process of, of just sharing the book. Um, you know, I, in 2000, and one thing I will mention just because it's, it, it's a very big part of my transformation. Um, after the book was published in 06, I created some scholarship programs in, in my brother's name uh, for kids with disabilities. And uh, I actually raised money for, an organization called COPS as well, which is Concerns of Police Survivors, which is an organization that helps families of police officers that were killed in line of duty. Mm. Um, and I did that for two years. And then with anything, you know, it's a self-published book. I don't have a book deal. So any sales were self-generated. And right. after a right. while, the the sales started to go down and I hadn't yet been on, you know, there wasn't social media yet right. during those times. Um, so I was struggling to figure out how to keep money coming in and uh, to, to support the, the programs. So I decided to um, run across the state of New Jersey um, solo and- uh, run, I, run, did you say run? Yeah, 78.8 miles. Wow. Um, now mind you, I was diagnosed with a, a rheumatoid disease. Um, so I'm not supposed to be running. Jeez. And I, I decided that the only way anybody's gonna give a crap about Matt Kubler and his, his vision is if I create something so dramatically insane that they got to pay attention. So I started to uh, come up with this idea and I planned out my course and I started going on, um, you know, calling all the news media outlets in Philadelphia and went on a bunch of TV shows promoting the run. And um, I ran three consecutive marathons in three days um, and broke six bones in my feet, had a seizure at mile 40 um, and never walked one step and finished on time. And uh, that was the moment. And I, I think it's important for the people watching the show. You know, I, I'm not a bragger and I certainly don't um, live a life where I'm constantly out promoting how great Matt Kubler is. Um, but I do highly recommend that everybody do something once in their life that challenges them in a, in a physical, spiritual, emotional way to the point where they don't think they can accomplish it. And I, when I go into schools, I do a lot of talking about understanding what your very best is. And there's a great movie called uh, Facing the Giants. Love um, that. That That's one of my favorite clips of any movie ever. The Death Crawl. Yep. I use that in every one of my, my talks because there comes a point in time where you just think you can't yep. anymore. And there's always more. And your brain negotiates with your body to yep. stop when it wants you to stop. And... What I found was when you when you set a, a time that you have to be at a certain place and you're running there, um, and you don't have a plan B, right. that plan is your only option. Yep. And um, through every broken bone, through my feet swelling four times what they were, to um, I don't even know if you call it running what I was doing um, towards the end. Um, but when it was all done and I collapsed and, and had an emotional breakdown to much, so much that my wife had to finish my speech, um, I realized what my very best was. And I realized that um, I had pushed my mind, my body, and my spirit past any place that I'd ever – and my, I'd you know, done a lot of really cool physical things in, in the past. Yeah, I'd done a lot of training. I'd trained with the world's best. Yeah. And it paled in comparison to what I actually had to give 
to give my very best. I mean, and, dude, let, let, let's for anybody hopping on. I mean, you train with the Navy SEALs. <laughs> like that's that's intense. Like everything you just said, like, um, um, have you read or listened to listen to the book um, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins? Yes. Like you just described his story, too, like running on broken bones, hundred mi- an ultra marathon. And like, that's insane. And but I did it because I needed to I, and in a weird way. And I, I, I needed to feel pain. I needed to hurt. I needed to um, be alone in my mind. I had to um, argue with God some more. <laughs> I had to cry a little bit more. And I remember I was I was probably in the second the second day towards the end, and I'm running through this little town, and I had just been on the news, and it was the same day that I had my seizure. Um, in the first, I did three runs in the day, so I would do a, like an eight mile, a ten mile, and a seven miler. Jeez. And I was on the seven mile part, and a woman pulls over to the side of the road and asked me to stop. So I stop and she hands me a um, hundred dollars and she says, I saw you on the news tonight and I just wanted to tell you, I'm proud of you and thank you. And that was like the mile one of seven. Wow. <laughs> right? So, so now I had six miles of barely running more of a, a brisk hobble and uh, <laughs> I'm sobbing oh my for God. Six miles because I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop crying. Wow. And I'm, yelling, I'm like, what are you doing? Like people are driving by and they're looking at me weird. And I'm like, what are you doing? You get it together. But I couldn't stop. And wow. uh, so when you get done something like that, and trust me, I never want to do that again. Um, right. That was a once in a lifetime experience that was meant to be just once. Yeah. And, but that that knowledge that I had, the, the strength and the fortitude and the, the emotional and, and um, mental power to force myself through Jeez. the worst of the worst feelings that I've ever had and came out on top. Yeah. And the reason why that's important in, in this whole story is because it, it, you know, I wrote the book and I released a lot of demons and I was feeling a lot better, but I wasn't yet there. And that was there. That's when I got there. Wow. And from that day forward, in 2008, in May of 2008, that's when I really started to see where I wanted to go um, with my life. And it's not about, it will never be about money. It will never be about materials, things that I can collect. It's always about experiences and it's about connectivity and it's about um, making sure that when I die, no one will ever question what I did. Wow. My brother, and I'll I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. I found out the reason why I was so angry is because I thought my brother never lived. Mm. And what I found was, after I wrote this book, every summer my brother went away to this camp. And um, it was a Christian camp, and I never went there. A family friend, um, family ran this camp, and he went there and cut grass, and did stuff and he lived there all summer and all these people I didn't know. But when my brother died, you know, we have a pretty messed up family. We don't have a whole lot of um, cousins or aunts or uncles that talk to each other. So if it was just family and close friends, there wouldn't have been a whole lot of people there, but there were probably a thousand people at my brother's funeral. Wow. I remember thinking, who the hell are they? (laughs) Like I never, I didn't know why these people were there and I couldn't, come to terms with who they were and, and I didn't know any of them. And after I wrote the book, I found out all these stories about my brother from people that he had met every summer over four years that painted a picture of a completely different life that my brother had lived that was separate from all the heartache and the, and the disappointment of his grades and the struggles in our family and, and all this. He could just be him. Wow. And when I realized that, I stopped being angry because my brother lived. My brother lived an amazing life. My brother touched so many people. People have named their kids after my brother. They named, they built a gymnasium for Christ's sakes at this camp and named it after my brother. Wow. Like, 
you don't get that by being insignificant. No. And I don't ever want, I don't want anybody to ever be at my funeral and wonder why someone else is there. Mm. I want them all to know individually why they are there and whether they assume or know that everyone else is there for the same reason. And that's when it all comes down to it for me. I don't know if tomorrow's it or I'm going to live till 99. But between now and then, I'm going to make sure that my life had meaning, that I, um, I impacted the lives of others. My tagline for my company is living a life of selfless service worthy of remembrance. I will always serve in such a way that people will always remember why I did it. Jeez. We could stop right there, but we're not. But that dude, like you're, you're holy crap, man. And it was Steve, wasn't it Steve uh, Guzman that, that connected us? Was yes. That, and I've yeah. never met Steve either. So Steve's a good dude. I've never met him myself, but I, we've talked. He works with a, a childhood friend of mine. So they, okay. Uh, Good yes, dude, man. Good dude. I'm yeah. glad he, I, and it was his idea to connect us. So I'm, I'm glad he did. So a couple of things. Um, first off, what's the name of the book? Tell my audience, because I'm sure some of them, if not all of them, if you don't all go get the book, then don't ever watch my show again. Um, so I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but what's, what's the name of the book? A Brother's Love, A Memoir. A Brother's Love, A Memoir. Um, if somebody would type that into the comments, I would be very, very grateful. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, go to Facebook and watch it so you can see the comments. Um, <laughs> I have, I have people make comments on the YouTube video later and I'm like, I can't help you. Um, but the, um, so you have a, uh, you started a business also a, a, a gym. Yeah. So. In 2009, during the middle of a recession, which I highly do not recommend you start a fitness business um, <laughs> during a recession, um, me and uh, two partners, one that's still remaining, um, we bought some existing technology that was invented at the University of Florida, um, a company called Max Out, which is a, uh, a unique strength development type product. Uh, back back then that was utilized basically using a counterweight system connecting it to existing weight racks which allows you to lower a heavier weight and lift a lighter weight um, we started a business we, we took the business that was folding actually in, in Florida and, and bought it out of bankruptcy essentially moved it up to outside of Philadelphia and opened up max out strength studio hence the shirt yeah uh, long story short we've been open since 2009 and we've had seven or eight different business plans that have all failed. Um, we were going to franchise. We went through all the process. We became a legal franchise. Um, and then I realized, and this is something I think that's really significant for, for entrepreneurs, especially when you have partners and you're not the money guy. Like I'm not the money guy. I'm the get shit done guy. And right. Jason, who's my, my business partner, who's the, the financier of this operation. And thank God for him. Um, he believed in me yeah. and I believed in him. And at the end of the day, we tried a lot of things that didn't work. Um, we franchised, we tried to franchise, we opened multiple gyms, they all closed, except for the main one. Um, I realized that I, what I was trying to do with a franchise was take me and put me in 400 locations. Sure. And I realized I couldn't do that. I realized that I was unfranchisable, that no one will ever get to the depth of passion that I have for my company. And I could never expect that from someone who's not prepared to go there. Right. And it yep. took a long time to figure that out. And what yep. we decided from that was we were going to become, a, we were gonna spend our money and our time wisely and we were going to um, take the existing technology which is no longer patent uh, pr protected. It was bulky, it was unable to be made at an efficient price point, let alone sold. And we were gonna take that and we were gonna try to create a new patented design that would allow us to go to market and, and actually be productive. So we spent three and a half years doing R and D uh, and with engineers and um, designs, and we finally um, came up with our new device, and we got three patents. Uh, wow! On, and uh, we are partners with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They utilize our equipment. Um, I know they sucked hind tit yesterday. Go um, Steelers! Steelers! 
Just, um, just, just retire our quarterback and get some new blood in there. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but we're very proud of the fact that they believed in us and they actually called us. Wow. Um, Matt Kevich, who is a uh, special teams backup linebacker, uh, number 44 for the Steelers, played at Temple University. And Temple had a piece of our equipment they were utilizing, and Tyler loved it. And, um, and I'll give you just uh, how connectivity works and how yeah. – being persistent and consistent has value. About four or five years ago, we met with the University of Pittsburgh um, Human Performance Lab, and we were going to do a joint study using our technology with the lab for the Army um, for rehabbing soldiers injured in combat. Yeah. Long story short, it didn't go through. The funding never came through. Um, but we had all these in-depth meetings with them. Well, they share the same building with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the strength coach staff for the Steelers was talking with one of the guys from the human performance lab and the strength coach guys like, man, I wish I could make like a winch system that we could put on top of a squat rack so we could offload weight during the, the lifting phase and let them lower heavier weight. And the guy's like, wait a second. About five years ago, we met with a company that does that. And they're from Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. I'm like, no shit. We're like, yeah. So <laughs> we get a phone call from um, Guy Guimont. Uh, who's the head uh, strength coach from the Steelers. Yeah. And uh, message basically saying, hey, heard you guys. Oh, so they Googled, before they made the phone call, they Googled and they saw a video of Tyler Matakevich working out on our equipment. Ah. Uh. So they pull Tyler and they say, this max out thing. What do you think of it? He goes, oh, dude, that's, that's amazing. That's all, Are we going to get it? And they're like, I don't know. We're going to talk. Long story short, we have this phone call. We installed two of our old pieces of technology about a year and a half ago. Um, and they had their best, one of their best years ever as far as health, as wow. far as safety, um, and not having as many injuries. They didn't produce necessarily the, the win total they were looking for, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're, we're a tool in their in their Sure, arsenal. yeah. And then in March, we installed our newest piece of equipment, um, the E-Force um, 350 into there, replaced our old equipment, put in the new device. And, uh, yeah, we did a three year deal with them where we're partnering with them and we have devices going out to the Detroit Red Wings, the New York Mets. Um, wow, man. Yeah. Things are, we went from franchising and opening a shit ton of gyms and trying to become the world's only once a week workout. And it's amazing what we do, the, the results that we get. Yeah. Um, like an example, my daughter is a senior college swimmer. Um, look, three-time All-American. She's amazing. She weighs like 140 pounds. She squats 255 pounds free Jeez. weight. And she presses 180. What? Uh, free weight. And so wow. she's a machine. And she's been training with me since we, we started this program. And so what we do is amazing. Um, but we just never found the right way to utilize our, our value yeah. in the marketplace. And right. Finally, we do. And so we're very excited about where we're headed as a company. We're never opening another gym. Um, the gym business is is by far the most frustrating and difficult business I've ever been in. Yeah. Um, for many reasons. And, you know, most gyms today are you know, using sledgehammers, kettlebells, and big tires. And, you know, it costs them 200 bucks to open up their gym. And I, yeah. mine costs 1000 So yeah. Yeah. a whole different, whole different world. And so being an entrepreneur... Um, if it wasn't for someone who had faith and, and the financial wherewithal yeah. to keep this thing afloat, we wouldn't be here today. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't recommend anybody ever open a business during a recession. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's just not smart, but yeah. um, it just adds to the, the, the story line sure. when it's said and done. So, so you have, um, so you have the, you have a gym still, right? Yep. yep. Okay. And that's I call in it a beat laboratory. What's that? Did you ever see the movie Step Brothers? Oh yeah. So that's my favorite movie of all time. It's one of so mine I, too. We, we, you um, touch my drums. <laughs> we play my drums. <laughs> this is my beat laboratory. <laughs> yeah. That's what I call max out. It's my beat laboratory. So your gym um, is called max out. Yeah, the gym is called Max Out Strength Studio, and our wow. the company that owns the patents is uh, and the manufacturing part of our business is Max Out Equipment. And you own the um, rights to Max Out. Yeah, um, and I, I'm sure there's some some boundaries in which Max Out can be used that we own. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, 
you know, wow. Ed Blatt, he knows who I am. Um, and, oh, Ed, Ed knows who you are? Yeah, well, I sent him a nice little message about the trademark Max out. Um, saying, oh. hey, <laughs> I said, if you want to come on my podcast, we could talk about it. But uh, oh, it's that's uh, awesome, dude. It's 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 a great. Um, yeah, you know, we do things with neurological, neuromuscular. Yeah. Rehab. I help people with you know cerebral palsy, ALS, TBI, strokes. Um, not wow. just not just professional athletes or athletes in general. So, um, the wow. the way the technology can be utilized to help the human body is endless. Um, and we're just scratching now the surface on a, on how to you know, market and, and sell our equipment to those spaces. So, um, if anybody has a major manufacturing company that in the fitness space and wants to talk about a licensing deal, hit a brother Dude, up. I, I am, uh, I, I'm gonna, I'll wait till we hang up <clears throat> with the live stream, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very connected to some people in, in, in giant, 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 giant companies. So, um, that I can probably connect you with, but so the, um, but I, I want to ask you a couple, you know, and first off we're, we're at an hour and one, one and a half minutes, but that's okay. It's the internet and it's my show and we could go all day if we want. Um, I don't know that everybody would stay on here, but I do want to ask you a couple things. Um, number one, the name of your podcast, um, two dates and a dash podcast. And it comes from the movie, the dash. Uh, the the poem the dash which talks about your born date and I your love, death date and the yeah. dash is what matters. I love that poem. Yeah, um, two dates and and a dash. Yep. Okay, that's the podcast name. Um, where where is the best place for everyone to follow you on social media? Um, yeah, social media. I have multiple pages, but Matt Kubler um, on Facebook. Don't go to Matthew Kubler. He's my cousin in South Carolina. Great guy, but I'm not sure. His content's going to be nearly <laughs> as uh, on point as mine. Right. Um, so Matt Kubler uh, is on Facebook. Uh, Matt Kubler Speaks on Instagram. Um, I Got You Pub Speak on Twitter. Uh, Matt Kubler on LinkedIn. Um, I have a YouTube page. Um, wow. My website's mattkubler.com. Yeah. Um, podcast is on there as well. Um, so mattkubler.com probably has all your connections. Every link that they yeah. could get to. So everybody check him out on mattkubler.com. Before we go, I want to ask you a question that I ask everybody. Um, and that is, in your opinion, this is just about your opinion. Um, you've, I'm sure you've arrested at least one or two people in your career. Um, you've done, man, you've done some crazy stuff, dude. I mean, like crazy. Remind me to never get into a fight with you. Um, so, I'm a big teddy bear. What? I'm a big teddy bear. Yeah. Oh yeah. Until you until you don't need to be. So I go from zero to Corky. Let's just say. <laughs> yeah, it takes right. a lot to get me to Corky. So so um, but what what do you think in in your experience in your life? Um, you know, because I do, I like, dude, anybody that says they don't like material things will lie to you about other things as well. I think everybody loves to have nice things. Um, a lot of people won't do the work that's required to get to that level. Um, but you know, we all like nice things, right? And if you've never eaten at a, at a five-star steakhouse, trust me, there is a huge difference between that and Ponderosa. I've, I've been in both. Um, so what do you think the number one thing is that holds people back in life that keeps them stuck and not going for it? Because I, we talked, we talked before I have a lot of friends in law enforcement. I mean, a lot, lot, and I'm sure you have more than I do, but like, there's a there's a there's this thing where I know a lot of my friends have dreams of owning businesses or whatever and they just haven't done it, right? But so what's the thing do you think not with just law enforcement but everywhere like that holds people back, man? So one thing I didn't mention is my background is in human behavior and body language. So you know growing up with a brother who couldn't speak mm. and um who had 
cognitive issues. I, I was very good at understanding what he needed and what he wanted when he wanted it and needed it. Yeah. Um, and I could finish his sentences. And, and throughout my life, I realized that that was a gift my brother gave me um, or God gave, gave us. Yeah. That allowed me to be very good at what I do as a police officer and, and doing counterterrorism and as a, an entrepreneur and, and even as a podcast host. And that's why I do live video interviews because I like to see the person that I'm interviewing so that I know whether or not what I'm saying is resonating or not. Yeah. And the thing that I've realized, and, and this may not be the answer you, you were looking for, but the, this is what I believe. No, I'm looking for your answer. The human behavior is very specific based on personality profiles. That's the baseline for everything that, that causes us to do or, or act or say or, or become any of it. Um, we have your authentic self and then you have your, your adaptive self, we call it. Yep. which is you act like when expected to act a certain way. Right. And I think inherently um, what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur is unique to an entrepreneur. And that if, if you choose a life of um, being an office worker and that's where you're happy and that's where you're, you're doing your best, then that's where you're supposed to be. And if you were to go act as a, in a way that an, uh, that an entrepreneur does, you probably wouldn't succeed. And as a police officer, and, and I know we talked about this in the beginning, I, yeah. my profile, if you looked at my personality profile, and you, I'm sure you've heard of the disc profiles. And yep. So my one of my best friends owns one of the largest disc profiles um, companies in the world, and Tony Robbins actually uses his. Um, and I do work for him. Um, my disc profile on Intermetrics is D, I, and S, or all 67s. Oh, wow. And my, C, and my C is a two. Yeah. So for people that don't know what that means, D is your dominant personality, I is your influencer personality, S is your steadfast personality, and C is your, you know, the more of the data minutia type stuff. Right. I don't have the, a C. My C is non-existent. But my DIS are pretty much equal all the way across. So I have the ability to blend across multiple different genres, for lack of a better word. Most entrepreneurs are driven by the risk reward component of, of being an entrepreneur. Cops are risk reward, but our risk reward is based on there's certain protective layers around us that we know to be true regardless of the outcome. Right. I know that I have my pension, I have my life insurance and it's double indemnity if I'm killed in line of duty. I know that you know, my wife and kids will get X, Y, and Z. And if I'm killed in line of duty, my kids will get free school. Like there's a lot of things that happen on the risk side. Yeah. That the reward may not be the reward if I die, but the reward is that if I do die, there's protective levels in place. Right. Just the same reason I carry a gun or, or a baton or my bulletproof vest or whatever. There's protective measures in place. And as an entrepreneur, those protective layers are gone. Yeah. It's you your effort and your willingness to go take that risk in hopes that there's a reward. And more often than not, you have no reward in the beginning and you have to keep staying persistent and consistent throughout that. So I think to answer your question, what holds people back is inherently based on who they are. And there isn't a, a there isn't a single, you can't say to a, a, a high S high C go out and be bold and do crazy things. Cause that's just not who they are. They <laughs> make it sexy and cool to go do that. Right. But when given the opportunity, they're going to fail or say no, hopefully say no, because it's not inherent <laughs> who they are. But I, I, I and I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm also, and maybe this, this falls in somewhere on that disc disc profile, but I, I, I think, and so, I think that that people can choose. They can choose, and they can re they can learn a different way to live. Because and the only reason I say that is I, I you know being a recovered alcoholic, where literally alcohol was more important to me than breathing. Right, like it was. And and the fact is is that I I, 
I changed, like significantly changed. And I used to live not for nothing but me, and that's it. I didn't care about you or anybody else. And now I'm the exact opposite of that. That doesn't mean my personality on the disc profile changed, but I think that there probably were some significant changes. So I, I just am curious if you think that people can change. I think within a, a scope and depending okay. on, so there are, there are, um, so I have an addictive personality. Yeah. I don't know so, what that's like, but <laughs> so, but I mean, listen, I know I got to say no to certain things. And sure. It's not that I become, I'm, I become an addict per se, but because I become easily habitual. Sure. Um, which can be a great thing. Right. Uh, when it comes to things you want to be habitual with. Right. Um, right. But I also know that there's certain things that I'm just never going to be. And it's right. not because I don't want to be those. It's just because I know that I'm either, I don't have a want to really do it. I think ultimately it comes down to that. I think it comes down to when you hit a certain point in whatever, whether it's your personal life, your professional life, um, your spiritual life, your relationship life, when you want something more, than what you currently have or doing, then that yeah. becomes the driver behind your decision making. And I think your want to not be an alcoholic anymore became greater than your desire to have alcohol. Yeah. And that, that's a choice that you make. And I think those are things that um, situationally things change. Um, you know, a trauma can yeah. happen. Yeah, that sure. changes things. I wasn't an angry person growing up, um, but I came real angry when my brother died. Yeah, sure. And so, I mean, there's, 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 I think there are, there, there's triggers that happen that cause change. Um, and there are things that you can self change, sure. you can self self create. And I do believe in mindset and I do believe in positive, um, yeah. belief systems and constantly staying on a positive because I can see how easily if I paid attention to everything that, you know, one of the news agencies said that I don't agree with. Um, if I let that you know, perpetuate my mindset, I could see how that would affect me. Yeah. Wow. And, and I think, and you see how that happens across America, where people are just one way, and that's no way because of everything they're they're in, they're putting into themselves from the outside. That it takes a lot of their own internal self-generated thought processes and puts them to the curb. Dude, you're you are, you're you're a you're dude, you're you're awesome, man. You're you're Thanks. a rock star, man. I, I I'm so grateful I had you on. Um, one last question. Have you ever heard I've only had two? <laughs> yes. And then we're like, how big were they? <laughs> <laughs> two out of a two bathtub. Bombs. Yeah. Right. So, so Matt, listen, dude, you're awesome. I, I Everybody go to mattkubler.com. Patricia Lynn Burgess put it up on the screen. So thank you for that, Patricia. It's on, I've had it on your website up on the screen for a while. Um, you're incredible. I'm, I, I wish you nothing but continued massive success and, and lots of, lots of joy and, and peace and everything that you're doing, man. You, I appreciate you rock. the opportunity. I really do. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't, I went for about a year where I was a guest on a lot of podcasts yeah. and then I started doing my own and I was doing two to three a week. So I stopped being a guest on people's podcasts. So this was a nice, um, I took a month off this month, um, to change the format of my show. So I'm very happy that uh, Steve made this connection and then I got yeah. to be on you. Dude, you're awesome, man. So thank you to everybody who watched. Thank you to everyone who shared this out. If you didn't share it out, you still have an opportunity. So go ahead and do that. And, and Matt, don't hang up on Skype, but I wanna say thank you to everybody. Thank you again to you as well, Matt. Thank you. All right, we'll see you guys later.